Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad to see so many friendly faces here. My name is Terry Phillips. I am running for the United States House of Representatives seat in California's new 23rd district. I'm surprised by how few people know what the boundaries of this district are, by the way, even people who are in politics. You know, it was redistricting as there is uh, every 10 years after the census. The current district that we're in goes to the coast, and it stops at the northern edge of Kern County. The new district cuts off at the western edge of Kern County and now goes up into much of Tulare County. So it really is a new district. And so, in a sense, we don't really have an incumbent yet. Yes, it's true Kevin McCarthy is representing this part of the district at the moment, but we're both new to this race, and so I am very pleased to have any opportunity to meet constituents, hear what you have to say, and let you know what's on my mind. Let me just tell you a couple quick things about me personally. I was born here in the Valley. I grew up in Fresno. My uh, parents are um, immigrants. My dad was born in Turkey. He's a Greek national. My mother's parents were Armenians, also from that part of the world. And uh, they all came here. They all became good American citizens, learned English, and gave me the, uh, the blessing to be born in this country. My father was a blue-collar worker. He's no longer living, but uh, at the uh, time that I was a kid, growing up in Fresno, in construction, things were slow. So we moved up to San Jose, where he found work, and that's where I uh, finished school, and that's where I decided to become a journalist. And so I went to work first for the local uh, television stage, public television station, and eventually became a foreign correspondent for CBS News. I traveled around the world, covered the collapse of the Soviet Union, covered conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, Somalia, Bosnia, Haiti, all the garden spots. And then finally came back to my home here in the Central Valley, and I was shocked to discover that here, at home, where we taught the rest of the world about democracy of this era, that we had so little of it. People I saw elsewhere uh, around the planet were struggling for the right to control their destinies, and in election after election, we only had one name on the ballot for given offices. And so I said, I, I wrote a, a, an op-ed for the Bakersfield, California, and I said, you know, this really isn't very democratic. Somebody else ought to run. And the only response I got was, okay, smart guy, so run. <laughs> so we formed an exploratory committee, my pals and I, and uh, found out that it was actually possible to run, actually possible to get on the ballot, and that I actually had some serious differences of opinion with Kevin McCarthy. I am really sorry that Kevin's not here today. I, I think it's a pity. This is supposed to be the great current debate. And, I, I, you know, I don't want to debate an empty chair. I know that worked well for uh, Penn Eastwood, but I, I would really like to talk to my opponent. Uh, we were both on Channel 17 a couple months ago, and Mr. McCarthy said, you know, no problem with the debate. I always debate my opponent. I don't see any evidence that he's ever debated a de an opponent in, in races for Congress. I, I uh, think that maybe he had a, a forum when he was first running for the state assembly, but that's been it. And so, you know, I don't really mind that he uh, is busy, that he's doing the people's work, but I think at least once every two years he ought to show up and defend his record. So I'm here, despite the fact that he's not, I'm happy to take your questions, to tell you what I think about different things, and mostly to learn what you think, because I think that's the job of a representative, and I thank you for the forum. Thank you, Terry. Okay, first question from the audience. Anybody? Yeah, I would like to know. Hey, uh, hold on a second, Clay. Leander on over there. Hey, Clay. Uh, you know there there is another speed other than super slow. I'd like to know. Listen, I, I got to tell you, I will pay for this on the radio next week. I guarantee you that. I'd like to ask Mr. Phillips why he refused to salute the flag at a Rotary Club meeting and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Let me ask you a question, sir. Who told you that I did that? Well, uh, several people that were at the Rotary Club. But you, you yourself was, were, were not there? No, I wasn't. Okay. Well, I was there. Let me tell you what happened. Because there's been a lot of confusion about what happened that day back in 2008. First, let me tell you that I've been saluting the flag since before Kevin McCarthy was born. <laughs> I, I was a scout. I was captain of the safety patrol. And I understand how important that symbol is of our, to our country. But at that time, I was invited to come and speak about various topics. I was working for uh, the public radio station, and I was uh, asked to talk about the world events. And I had been in Iraq, and I had been in Afghanistan, and then I came back and saw all of the protests going on in this country. Some were very destructive, 
but some were very respectful. And I wanted to talk about that in my speech. So during the Pledge of Allegiance, I stood at attention, silently, and then when I uh, spoke, I mentioned, among other things, that some of you have noticed that I didn't recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And every, I had everybody's attention. Every single pair of eyes was on me. That was my purpose. And then I talked about the role of dissent and protest in our country. It's something we've been doing since that first Tea Party, as I'm sure you know. It was not a gesture of disrespect. Uh, unfortunately, you know how, you know the game of telephone where one person tells another person and then finally it ends up being the opposite of what happened? That's what happened with this story. But I come from a family of patriots. I was not in the service, but I was a war correspondent and I worked alongside our troops in the field. I understand what this flag means. And it really upsets me when people accuse me of being unpatriotic. That is not the case. Thank you, Terry. Next question. Oh, you're not the, you're not, uh, you don't have a question, you just have the mic. We, we needed somebody with a little more... No, I'm Clay. Oh. Go. Many of us have been disappointed with the prolific spending by the present administration in Washington, D.C. And I was appalled yesterday to hear the president say, well, this really isn't a short-term problem. It's a far-term problem. And so he uh, seems to be very happy to continue on with this terrible deficit which we're piling onto our children and grandchildren and grandchildren. Grandchildren. Do you support that? Do I support the idea that we're piling debt onto our children and grandchildren? It's fact. We are doing that. Here. Well, right. we are doing that. Should we, we be doing that? Of course Should not. we be doing it? Of course what, not. And maybe what we should say is, what will you do right. to attempt to stop that? First, I appreciate the question. And, and I think that anybody, whether he is an economist or not, should understand that debt, family debt, national debt, individual debt, these are not good things if they are... Uh, long term and if they are ever increasing. One of the problems with debt is that it's not just the cost of the resources that we no longer have available to us, it's the cost of paying for the resources, the, the interest on the debt. And you reach a certain tipping point of the debt where it becomes impossible. It doesn't matter anymore how much you cut, how much you sacrifice, how much more revenue you bring in. We can genuinely reach a point where it will be impossible Unless we do something drastic, as some countries have done, you, I'm sure you'll remember in history that there have been countries that, um, that revalued their currency. You know, devaluation, no one's talked about that luckily yet, but if you want to see a market crash, suggest devaluation. But those are the kinds of risks that we wait for us out there. I believe that we have two solutions to the problem of our national debt. The first is that we need to know, in fact, how much money we're spending. How many of you know how much money the government spends today? I don't. I don't think anybody does. The government, a lot of agencies, including the Defense Department, haven't been audited in decades. We really don't know how much money is being spent, how much money is being wasted. And the other problem is we make decisions. I say we because we're all responsible. Our representatives in Congress make decisions about how we should spend money based on the status quo. Why don't we take another look and see if, in fact, we need all of these programs that we've been spending. And why is it that California is a net exporter of federal dollars? We send about $1.65 to Washington. We get back about 85 cents on the dollar. Um, Bill, Bill Thomas, the previous congressman, brought back about a buck five for every dollar we send. We are losing money on our money. I think we need to look at, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a journalist and I, uh, facts are important to me. We need to know what the facts are. And then we need to figure out what we really need to spend and how we can pay for those things. But to talk about these things in the abstract, as I know politicians do, they love to say, I'm going to cut taxes. Well, fine, but what does that mean? We need, to, we need to know what the facts are before we start deciding whether to cut or raise, God forbid, taxes. Thank you, Terry. Okay, next question. Marvin. Thank you for coming, Terry. Uh, my question is... Uh, what would you do different in Kevin, and uh, why do you think you can do a better job? First, let me say, I have never met 
Kevin McCarthy. I've never stood this close to the man. Um, uh, we spoke on one occasion. We, we were across the room from each other. There was a water conference over at uh, Bakersfield College uh, last year. And he was the keynote speaker at lunch. And um, I had just read about a bill that he co-sponsored with Devin Nunes to give control of California's water distribution to the federal government. And that didn't make much sense to me. So I wrote an op-ed piece that was published in the Fresno paper, and then he was at this water conference. So I asked him a question from across the room, and he answered it, and that's been the extent of my connection to Kevin McCarthy. So I don't want to say anything about him personally. I don't know him. I know that a lot of people, including, I presume, many people in this room, know him. Some of you, I think, have known him for years since he was a young man. And many of you probably like him. He seems to be a likable guy. I don't think that's a bad thing. I just don't think it's enough to be our representative in Washington, especially when what he does, how he votes, is not necessarily in our best interests. And so to answer your question, I would vote differently than he votes. I would, for example, not have voted 70 times, 7-0, seven 70 times, in, on the first bill of this term to eliminate the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act was, Pat, was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. It has saved this country, over the course of those years, $22 trillion in health care costs. Mr. McCarthy wants to get rid of it. I don't think that makes much sense. Mr. McCarthy wants to get rid of the uh, Health Reform Act that was passed. I think the Health Reform Act that was passed was a terrible law. It was a lousy compromise, but it has good elements in it. And I don't think it makes much sense to throw it all out and start from scratch. I would do that differently. And, and I can go down the list. I can see that our moderator wants me to move on. But I, I have a long list of disagreements with him. You'll find details on my website, phillipsforcongress.com. Thank you, Terry. Okay, next question. Hilda. Rand Paul today was going to filibuster the Senate if Harry Reid did not allow the bill to come to the floor to audit the Federal Reserve. Would you be in favor of auditing the Federal Reserve? Absolutely. Oof. Absolutely. I don't think anybody should get a free pass. It's our money. I mean, it's not a socialist country. I recognize that there's <laughs> private money in this, too. And, and by the way, may I say something? I have lived and worked in socialist countries. I was in the Soviet Union and, and, and elsewhere, and, and, and I know the difference between what's going on here and what's going on there. I'm not campaigning for President Obama. But well, let's be honest. The man is not a socialist. He is an anti-socialist. A lot of the policies of our government are not very good policies. But to put a label like that is inflammatory. You all are intelligent, good-hearted people. I think the very least we owe each other is honesty and respect. And I am not here to defend or attack either a presidential candidate. Frankly, in my opinion, I don't think it makes a whole hill of beans which one is in the White House, because the responsibility for government, for allocating money, for deciding whether we go to war, and all the other things that are laid out in Article One of the Constitution all those things are the responsibility of Congress. So, if you don't, thank you. So, if you don't like how much tax you're paying, please talk to Kevin McCarthy. If you don't like the idea of our defense budget facing catastrophic cuts through the sequestration program, please talk to Kevin McCarthy. If you don't like the idea of high-speed rail, please talk to Kevin McCarthy. He's the one who persuaded Governor Schwarzenegger to put it on the ballot. And then Californians voted for it, and then Mr. McCarthy tried to pull the federal funds and has been campaigning against it. If you don't like these things, please talk to the man in Congress whose responsibility it is. And don't try to dump all the blame on the man in the White House who only has the money to spend that Congress allocates. Next question from the audience. Well, thanks. Drive home safely. Oh. <laughs> no, I just happen to have a couple here, Terry. There's <laughs> one here. Okay. Yeah. Well, since there was nobody else, I wanted to bring up something. Well, I don't need this. Politicians right here, full time, this is what they cause, both in Washington and in our state. Do we need the politicians full time? <coughs> Well, um, I don't think that politicians ought to be representing us in Congress. Uh, you know, the, the United States Congress in 1958 passed the U.S. Government Code of Ethics. And the first thing it says 
is that government officials must put loyalty to country ahead of loyalty to party. How many members of Congress do you think do that? <coughs> yeah, well, that's what I think, too. So I don't like the idea of partisanship in Washington. The problem is not that we have people spending too much time in Washington and in Sacramento. The problem is that the time they spend is counterproductive. It's not even unproductive. They spend their time with their arms crossed, both parties. I mean, I have friends here who are Democrats and Republicans. I'm sorry for insulting you, but it's your fault. And ultimately, it's our fault for sending them back after election after election after election. It's the partisanship that's the problem. Mm -hmm. My opponent is the, the leader of his caucus as the majority whip. It's his job to make sure everybody votes party line which is okay if the party is on the right side of an issue. But we're human beings, folks. No party is on the right side of every issue all the time. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a leader of a party. But if you're going to do that, then go apply for a job with your party. And don't claim you're representing all of your constituents. That's the problem, in my opinion. Got a mic there. You traveled. You traveled all these places throughout the world. What were you doing? What was I doing? I wasn't a tour. I was part of that. Actually, I was a tourist. Were you doing it for government? Were you doing? No, I was a I was a journalist. I was a, a news reporter, foreign correspondent, and I spent some of that time um, in conflict zones, in battle zones. I spent some of that time in nice places. But for the most part, I was there as a journalist reporting the news, from Moscow to Kabul to uh, Baghdad to Mogadishu to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And, and a good friend of mine, when I go down this list of, of awful places, likes to remind me that I was also in Detroit. So, <laughs> that's what I was doing. Talking about being in a war zone. <laughs> <laughs> OK, any other questions? Uh, let's see, young lady right. There. Hello, um, I'm a student at CSUB. Go Roadrunners! <laughs> um, I'm facing a bit of a bleak situation since uh, within the last 10 years, tuition has gone up um, over 200% at CSUB. And then when I do graduate in the fall, um, I'm not looking at good uh, prospects or jobs. Um, do you have any ideas on what to do about that? Yeah, and, and first of all, congratulations and, and good luck. Um, What's your major? Political science. <laughs> that was my major. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll tell you this about, about education in general. I think we, we can talk about all the other issues as much as we want. If we don't fix education, none of the rest of it matters. <laughs> Let me tell you something that I discovered the other day that shocked me, and maybe it'll shock you. Are you all aware that children are being born right now who are going to see the 22nd century? We're all excited about the 21st century and all this great stuff that we're doing, our iPhones and our iPads and I don't know what else. And, uh, and I don't have a clue what's going to be uh, important 100 years from now. But I know that kids are being born now and going to school now who are going to set the pace for the next century. And yet, in our district, are you aware that we don't have a master's degree, let alone a PhD, at Cal State Bakersfield for engineering or sciences? Why is that? We're so, we've got very smart people here. So when we have jobs at, you know, at the oil industry, which we can see right out that window, they have to import them. We don't have homegrown right. engineers with those advanced degrees, unless they left somewhere to study and then came back. And oftentimes they don't come back because they're recruited wherever they study. So that's a problem. But if I may throw one more stone at my absentee opponent here, he voted against Pell Grants. Well, as the cost of education goes up, a lot of kids can't afford to finish college. Some can't even afford to start. Why would you want to cut spending for education? And not only for students, for veterans. I don't understand this idea of cutting the things that will invest in our future. I understand cutting wasteful spending, but I don't understand how we can afford not to invest in our future in the bright minds of people who are born here if we expect them to stay here and improve our quality of life and their own. I think we need to spend money on education. One more question. I saw somebody over here with their hand up. No? 
Okay, in that case. Kathy, oh, Kathy, I'm sorry. I've asked this to the other candidates. I'd like to know, given the events that have been happening in the Middle East recently, the fact we have three mosques here in Bakersfield, one of which has a madrasa attached to it, I'd like to know what you are doing to inform yourself personally about radical Islam from their own holy books. Let me, let me tell you what I know about uh, Islam. First of all, uh, I mentioned that my parents were immigrants. My father was Greek. My mother's parents were Armenians. And if you know anything about world history, you're aware that almost 100 years ago, Christian Armenians were slaughtered by Muslims in Turkey. I know a little bit about the effect of what you call, quite correctly, radical Islam. But I've also traveled throughout the Middle East, and I know Muslims who are not terrorists, who are not what we would call radicalized. And in fact, every scripture, every holy book, has elements in it that are good and that are not so good. And they can be interpreted in ways that are beneficial and that are harmful. I think the thing we need to be careful of in talking about religion is that this country was founded almost entirely on the, on the basis of the belief that we must respect everybody's religions, everybody's ideas, everybody's practices, everybody's traditions. We are a country that would not exist today, that would not be as great as it is today, but for that principle. Now, it doesn't mean that it should be a suicide pact. We should not say, practice whatever religion you like, even if that includes killing me. Well, okay, we're not morons. But what we must not do, and what I would caution you not to do, is to overreact. When I was living in Detroit, uh, working for CBS, there was an attack on the federal building in Oklahoma City, you all know. And there was a Michigan connection. There almost, there's almost always a Michigan connection to every big story. And in, I don't know if you know the map of Michigan, it looks like that. And in the thumb of Michigan, there's a town called Decker. And there's a farm in Decker, Michigan that belongs to the Nichols family. And Terry Nichols was one of the conspirators that blew up the, uh, the federal building, the Murrah building in Oklahoma City. But when the story broke, the first thing we all heard was, it was Muslims. <coughs> and the first thing I did was to go, there's a large um, uh, Palestinian community just outside of Detroit. And the first thing I did was to go there and talk to, to uh, people in that community to ask, you know, what, what do you think about all this? Well, it didn't take us long before we figured out that was uh, a red herring. But we shouldn't jump to conclusions. We should treat each other with respect, understand each other, get to know each other better. That's how you avoid being victimized by radicals, by working together with people throughout our community. I say one last thing, if I may, about this. I was very moved by the reaction of the Sikh community here in Bakersfield. You all, I presume, know we have a sizable Sikh community. How, how moving it was that they, we all got together in front of uh, City Hall one night and we had a candlelight vigil, and I was moved by what they said. I mean, we all were asked to make speeches, but the Sikhs themselves talked about how they forgive and pray for even the perpetrator of that terrible crime in Wisconsin. It's hard for me to imagine doing that, but I, I, I really admire that inclusive, tolerant spirit. And I wish that we would all learn a little bit from them while keeping our own traditions, too. And I thank you for the question. Man. And uh, Terry, two minutes closing. OK. Well, I, again, I, you know, I not only want to thank you, I, I want to tell you how impressed I was from the beginning uh, of this little adventure. I've been warned by people about what I might encounter along the way. You know, I grew up, uh, I went to school in the Bay Area, and people have said, oh, Bay Area liberal, we know who he is, get out of here. <laughs> it's not true. I mean, I, my roots are here, my family is in Fresno, and I still have relatives in San Jose, but my, I'm grounded in this place. And these labels of liberal and conservative, I just, I don't believe them. I know that I'm conservative in many ways. I know I'm progressive in many ways. And put enough beer in me, and I'll probably come up with a few liberal ideas, too. But I appreciate how respectful you all are. I did a radio program for five years on the, uh, the NPR stations here in the Central Valley. I would hear from people all over the valley every week. And people always said, well, you know, this is some crazy guy on the line. He's going to say something uh, wacky, and he's going to attack you. And it never happened. 
It hasn't happened yet. I mean, yeah, there have been a few political operatives uh, who uh, have tried to stir things up a little bit, but that's, that's the game. I mean, I get that. Politics, as a wise man once said, ain't being bad. But I appreciate how respectful you all are, willing to listen to my ideas, and, and I, I hope you will, if, if you support my candidacy and if you do give me the, uh, the, uh, the blessing of sending me to Washington, I, I hope you will continue to treat me as your voice in Washington. I don't have all the answers. I don't think anybody does. I think the job of a congressman is to listen to everybody, to talk to everybody, and to do his or her best for everybody. If I have one complaint about my opponent, it is that he doesn't seem to be doing his job. He has another job, and that's okay. I, I respect that other job, but I wish he would be our congressman again. If you decide to send him back, I hope you'll send him back with those instructions. If you give me the chance to do the job, those are my are, are my marching orders. And I thank you all again.